Well, now, let's all stand for a minute and learn to sing a spiritual song. (laughs) Now, this is actually a song that you can hear sung in many other churches, including lounges, restaurants, and hotels. And it's called, Oh, Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble. (laughs) Now, there is a, uh, you know, such a put-down so many times, unfortunately, in in, uh, degenerate type of religion that uh, a lot of people spend a lot of years of their life recovering from it and beginning to realize who they are in Christ. So then you have to lean way in the other direction. And incidentally, that's what your dreams do for you. They come up and balance you, and I'll say something about that tonight. Your heart's telling you that you need some balance in the other direction many times in dreams. So this song is intended to balance people who have a poor self-image. And uh, you just sing it when you get to feeling blue, and it'll help you. I have a number of things I want to share with you, but I'm going to sing it, and you'll love it, and it'll bless you, and it's full of spiritual words. And it goes like this. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when I'm perfect in every way. And hardly wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Now, if the words in the third line are too strong for you, you can say one heck of a person or something like that. All right, let's sing it together now. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when I'm perfect in every way. Can hardly wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 4. Now, here's a little poem I want to share. And when you get into the realm of the Spirit that we talked about in the latter part of the message yesterday afternoon, remember that God's ways are higher than ours and His values are different than ours. And He doesn't think as a man thinks. And so when you find your real, true self, which is Christ in you, one and the same thing, the real, true self, the deep self, the treasure that's buried in the field that Wayne talked about, the pearl of great price, it's the only relevant Christ, Christ who's in you. Now, not Christ 2,000 years back down the corridor of history or Christ billions of light years out in space. But there's one Christ that you can really know by experience tonight, not even the Christ who's hidden between the covers, the leather covers of the Word of God, because that's filtered through the grid system of your mind and many times thoroughly conditioned by many, many centuries of tradition. But the Christ that you can really know is the one who comes and whispers in your heart, the one who says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In John 6, 63, one day scandalized a huge crowd of people by saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they were on a head trip like so many of us that I talked about yesterday afternoon were thoroughly conditioned to be rationalist and to live in the small space between our ears instead of in the great space of the infinite spirit that God's given us. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And so when Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which of course theologians have argued about for 2,000 years now, The crowd was astounded, and they said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? How can this man give us his flesh and blood to eat and drink? And so the Bible expressly says that from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus said to the ones who remained, Will you also go away? And notice they remained by choice. A crowd had been slimmed down considerably from the great masses who had come to see the miracles and be fed the miracle loaves. And he said to that smaller group, Will you also go away? And they said, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then he said to them, It is the spirit that makes alive, the flesh profits nothing, John 6. It is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. Doing what comes naturally can never get through the ceiling to penetrate into the mysteries, the values of God's kingdom. Can never bring heaven and heart together. Can never bring the great world of the macrocosm, the great world, together with the small world of the inner being, the microcosm, together. So that God could say, I am in you and you're in me. And the worlds come together and all lines are erased. That can only happen when you get outside your head, when the power of human thought is broken, 
The natural mind that's at enmity with God has come to a point of total exhaustion, and then we open up like a flower in the spirit and begin to understand, not with our heads, but with our hearts, and we don't understand by rationalism, but we understand by revelation. So Jesus said to that smaller group, it is the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words, rhemata in the Greek, rhema, the words that I speak, not words written on the page in the Bible, words written in the fleshy tables of the heart by the Holy Spirit, not words written in the Bible, words written by the Spirit for your edification personally in the fleshy tables of your heart in your deep unconscious down in your spirit. The words that I speak unto you in the intimacy and privacy of your heart, to paraphrase actu ac accurately, they are spirit. The words that I speak are spirit, and they are life. Now his life comes to us as the light that strikes the deep inner being of our heart. Now that's what I want to say as I lay a groundwork for this message tonight. These are things of the Spirit. There are many ways I could illustrate this. For example, the church is forever, and we heard a terrific song on unity tonight, and uh, the day will come perhaps when we'll have to seal our testimonies and our blood in the last days and so on, which was very stirring and moving. Now, many times through the years, the church has tried to affect a unity. The great ecumenical movement, planning committees, trying to tear down barriers between men and the rest of it. Now, here's a classic illustration of what I'm talking about. God never told us to do anything of this kind, and it never seems to work, and it never will work, I don't think, because there is already a unity established from before the foundation of the world. God doesn't say, try to be unified. He says, keep the unity. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that means that when we're all functioning in the spirit, all of a sudden we find out that we are related to the head and that we are members of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not an organization, earthly, three-dimensional. The body of Christ is a heavenly organism, eternal. And it's important to see that. And our unity is an upstairs thing. It's beyond three dimensions. It's unity so that one time, I think it was Kipling that wrote these famous words, when east is east and west is west, never the twain shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat, but there is neither east nor west nor border nor breed, creed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Now, Kipling touched on something real, namely that when two people in the spirit, doesn't matter a bit what their background is, because in Christ Jesus, and when we're on that wavelength and we're grooving on Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. But you have to get upstairs to experience those things. You see, the church with its natural thinking, and all of us are guilty of it because we have the treasure in an earthen vessel. We try to figure these things out and implement them and make them downstairs. They are already made done, signed, sealed, and delivered from eternity past, before there was a planet to stand on, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Are you aware of the fact that your eternal spirit was alive in Jesus Christ from eternity past? The Bible clearly says that you were chosen in Christ before the world was ever established. How about that? He was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. You see, in other words, what you and I cannot get out of, namely time and space in our heads, we can get out of, at least temporarily, in our experience, in our spirit, if we get flashes of glory from God in our spirit, all of a sudden, these prison houses of time and space are suspended and we find ourselves in a different dimension. Now, that's what God wants us to experience more and more. And all things Christian have to do with coming to the core of the matter, namely, getting out of your head and into your heart and finding the indwelling Christ. Now, in Galatians, the fourth chapter, here's a great prayer. It's a brief prayer but a very powerful one, which is the essence of Paul's ministry. He spoke about it when he wrote to the Colossian church. He said, I speak about Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man, and all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now, here's another thing that says the same thing in a prayer. Paul's praying for his own children that he brought to Christ in his first missionary journey, as recorded in Acts chapters 13 and 14, and here's his prayer. My little children, they were his children in the faith, I'm in birth pangs again over you, and this is maybe 10 to 14 years after they were saved and filled with the Spirit and full of enthusiasm, 
but they had had the veil sewed back up over their heart by dead religion. They had been leavened with the leaven of the Pharisees that Jesus warned about, the dead legalism that I attacked yesterday in my message. And so he's praying, My little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Now, he was born anew in Christ Jesus, though, from the standpoint of God, who is not locked up in time and space, he is the lofty one who inhabits eternity, as the Bible puts it. That man was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Our heads will never be able to grasp that any more than as man penetrates microphysics in the heart of the atom, he can really grasp the concepts there, because wholly different sets of laws prevail. Now, you see, when we're in the church of Jesus Christ, it's so easy for us to fall into the snare of trying to make people spiritual and trying to make ourselves spiritual, trying instead of trusting. And we think if we can teach people new behavior to act like Christians, then it'll come out all right. It won't come out all right. It'll be a horrible brand of heresy known as Galatianism or warmed over Judaism. It is not Christianity. Christianity is wholly other. It's a, an entirely different order. It's from another dimension entirely. It has nothing to do with modified behaviorism. It isn't a warmed over B.F. Skinnerism or something like that. It's a brand new life. And we read yesterday, the close of the message in Romans 8, that if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if Christ, if the spirit's in you, then you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. Now, we're already in the realm of the spirit. What needs to happen to us? Somebody has said this, that all progress in our Christian life, and this is a great line, that all progress in our Christian life, all progress in our growth, is not dependent upon trying to become someone, but is rather dependent upon seeing who we already are in Jesus Christ. That's a great line. Now, what is my task and what is your task? You have a ministry. That man who was born again, among many others, yesterday and today, will, though they may not realize it now, have a ministry. And what is that ministry? It's a ministry of life. And do you know what that ministry is? It's said again and again through the Scriptures. I could quote many passages, like Acts 26, 18, where Paul says, When preaching to the pagans, God sent me to the Gentiles to open their eyes, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those that God has set apart for himself. Or Ephesians 3, 9, Paul says, My ministry is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see, to make men see. Now, there are many techniques for making men see that the Holy Spirit uses, and I'm not going into them tonight. But I'd like to have you bear this in mind, that your ministry is to make men see. Your ministry is to see. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to take you and to lead you into all truth so that you can hear God's voice and see better with your spiritual eyes, so that you can get through the ceiling and receive light from God, so that light shines in darkness and overcomes that darkness. In other words, it expands your spiritual consciousness. Your spirit grows up and reaches out, and more and more the house lights are turned up so that you can see what's in that theater, what, so that you can see like if you were in a darkened museum that was full of treasures. You wouldn't be able to see the treasures, but slowly on a rheostat, the house lights are turned up and you see more and more in the way of treasures. Now, that's a pretty good analogy of what should happen in our spirits, because the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching out the inner being. So God wants us to see that there's a light in Bethlehem tonight. And where is that Bethlehem? Now, don't look at me and don't look at the person next to you. Kind of turn your spiritual vision inward and say this to yourself, that Bethlehem is within me, the child is born in me. Amen. That's what God wants us to see. And as Richard Wormbrand, the Romanian saint who was persecuted and tortured by the communists, said, I found out when I was in prison that my task was not to try to do something. My task was not to be forever doing for God. He said, in fact, God locked me up so tight in a communist cell I couldn't do anything. But he said, my task is rather to be someone. My task is to become the greatest human being, God in me, that I can possibly become. Amen. And that's your task tonight. That's the task of the Church of Jesus Christ. The fruit will take care of itself. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand on that if you want to. Now look again at that 19th verse of the 4th chapter that Paul's praying about this because these saints have been derailed. And we only have these two messages, so obviously I can't say as many things as I'd like to about it. But you study Galatians. If you want to have a real thrill, study it and... Uh, those who are given to this type of thing, start at verse 1, chapter 1, and start memorizing a few uh, verses a day or a week 
until you've completed the epistle and you'll find out that even when you wake up in the night that you'll see things that you've never seen before and anybody can memorize the word pretty much if he sets his mind to it you may not be able to memorize as much as the person next to you but you can certainly memorize it you'll see things if you start at chapter one verse one and go right on through the epistle you'd never see if you spot memorize the word now here's a great prayer that we're looking at in the 19th verse my little children of whom i travail in birth again till christ be formed in you well here are god's values and i want to read this poem that i mentioned earlier and it's written by a man who was a mystic hundreds of years ago he was way before his time he was kind of what we might call a mutation he lived before his time god had for it now you do not if you're yourself you do not have to be successful by somebody else's standard not all of us can make a great impact you know when i went out for the first time this comes into my mind right now to tulsa oklahoma to see oral roberts campus i was prepared to be impressed at that great campus because i knew that oral roberts did things right and i was impressed with his ministry in many many ways but my wife and i were not prepared to be as tremendously impressed as we were it's a fantastic work of art multi multi-million dollar campus where many have been blessed as they study the things of god and get prepared for their station in life and so we were deeply impressed with that but god certainly has not called you to be oral roberts nor has he called me to be oral roberts he's called oral to be that he's called you to be something else he may have called you to be somebody like the man whose poem i'm going to read you know what he accomplished he never built any great buildings as uh, far as i know he didn't write any great books he wrote some books that remain to this day they're hard to come by because this mid medieval mysticism but he was a man who knew and deeply loved God, and his words are living words. In fact, in the new Bible that Tom Cott gave me when I was preaching over in Summit last April, I wrote some of Salisha's words in the front of my Bible, and they're living words. They bless me no end. I want to read some more tonight. Listen carefully. There's a Bethlehem within you. Listen to what he wrote years ago. He was successful from God's standpoint because he became who God created him to be. And God's created you to be a unique package. You don't have to worry about whether you compare with somebody else. The Bible says they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. That's what Paul wrote to the Corinthian Christians. And yet we say, I've grown more than you have. I'm up the mountain higher than you are. And then we look up and see somebody we think is higher than, uh, than we've climbed. And then we say, well, I got a late start or your mountain isn't as big as mine or something like that. Isn't that ridiculous? And so we don't need to measure and compare. What you need to measure and compare by is, is that seed that God planted in the Bethlehem of my heart growing up to be king of my life? Am I becoming who I was created to be? Is the acorn that God put in my spirit becoming the oak that was inherent in the acorn that God intended it to be? That's the question. Don't be comparing yourself with those around you. Compare yourself with what God's treasure is within you. And that will give you a real blessing. And it will build you up. Now here are the words of this poem. If by God's Holy Ghost thou art beguiled, there will be born in thee the eternal child. If it's like Mary, virginal and pure, then God will impregnate your soul for sure. God make me, make me pregnant and his spirit shadow me that God may rise up in my soul and shatter me. What good does Gabriel's Ave Maria do unless he give me the same greeting too? Amen. May that sink into our hearts. Now I've been telling a little story that's blessed me no end. Richard Warmbrand, that I mentioned earlier in his excellent book with God in Solitary Confinement, a wonderfully living book, tells about the fact that while he was locked up those many years in solitary confinement, of course, he never saw his fellow Christians, and there were many others in the prison. But they learned to communicate with one another through the walls by tapping on the walls in Morse code and other codes that they devised. And so he met through the walls a man that he'd never seen by the name of Georg. And Georg told him this wonderful story. Every night, all the prisoners knew at 10 o'clock, like with extreme punctuality the brutal communist guards would come and at random drag out certain prisoners and brutally beat them and they knew that that was going to happen at 10 p.m. like clockwork every night and so they each one had different ways of preparing themselves and there was a jesuit priest who taught some of the people as he tapped through the walls to examine their conscience and examine their souls after the jesuit disciplines but georg was a different kind of christian he was not of that particular cut although that blessed the jesuit and some who were ministered to by him but Georg didn't like the business of it, uh, examining his conscience. He felt that the conscience was faulty anyway and was only a social instrument, which, hap which happens to be what I think the Bible teaches too. And I'd like to just pause at this moment and say, be sure you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and don't let your conscience put you down. The conscience is a social instrument, and the Bible says having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Many Christians are driven by a conscience 
that they just have not tur turned around and grabbed it by the ears and spit in its eye and said, look, you've helped me to grow up, but I'm not going to have you driving me through my superego all the while and making me a robot. Now, I wish I could say more about that tonight, but I can't say a whole lot, and it's on some of the tapes that I've done earlier, and you'll probably run across it because many of you listen to those tapes. But anyway, Georg said that wasn't for him to examine his conscience. What he liked to do each night to praise God and get prepared for whatever happened to him was to dance wildly before the Lord, as we heard. So in his solitary confinement, he would dance his mad dance before God. And as he was dancing one night, sometimes the guard would look in through the peephole and get the laughing at this mad dance that the fellow did. But one night when he was dancing, the guard wasn't looking, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him. Many times the angels appeared to the men in the cells and the women in the cells. And the angel Gabriel appeared to him and said this, Hail, Georg, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou. Wow, isn't that something? Well, now, you know where those words came from. That was what Gabriel said to Mary. And so Georg kept right on dancing. He'd been a real student of the early desert fathers, and he knew how to deal with angels, and he wasn't going to be taken by surprise. He just kept on dancing and kind of ignored Gabriel for a moment. And he said, you, there are many Georgs in this huge prison. You must be sent to somebody else. I'm not worthy to talk to angels. And the angel let him know, no, he was sent to him, and he hadn't made a mistake in his call. And then Georg tapped this beautiful message through the cell walls to his fellow Christians. He said, from that night on, after the angel Gabriel appeared to him, he was aware in his spirit that something great had been born in him, and that that thing that had been born anew and afresh in him. Now, he'd been a Christian for a long time, but in a new dimension, that the king had been born in his heart in the manger of his spirit. And from that time on, he had a mission in life that God gave him. And what was that mission? Well, for Georg, the mission was to make Jesus Christ visible in mortal flesh, namely in his flesh, in a unique way that he was to bring Christ into the 20th century and even to the men of the 21st century. He was an intellectual and so he wanted to relate Christ to intellectuals as was done so beautifully by the early church fathers as they lived what God created them to be. Now that's a great mission in life. God may not call you to that particular mission, but I'll tell you this part of the mission does overlap into yours. And it's this, that God wants Jesus Christ, the Word, to become flesh right now tonight and you are the one he has chosen to make Jesus visible right here in Hackensack, New Jersey, and environs. You are his choice instrument. And as the angel Gabriel appeared to Georg in his cell in Romania, so he appears in your heart tonight to say the same words that he said to Mary 2,000 years ago, Hail, Mary, thou that art highly flavored. Yes, flavored. I said that before. I'm going to have to see my dentist about that. Something's wrong with my eye teeth when I get into that. I'm going to have to rephrase the grammar. Hail thou that art highly favored. Give me a hand on that. I said it right. <laughs> the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. Now this is the Annunciation. I am not talking tonight about a Jesus who was born in Jewish flesh through Mary 2,000 years ago. I'm here tonight to tell you that that Jesus, if that's the one you're worshiping, and this may sound like heresy to you, but listen to it in your heart and in your spirit. That Jesus you cannot touch. Do you believe that? No, you don't believe that, do you? Well, why did he say to those who could touch him, who wanted to hang on to him, and who got very sad when he said, I'm going to die in Jerusalem and I'll rise on the third day, and then I'm going to part from you. It's expedient for you, for you, that I go away. John 14 because if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come unto you, whom I will send unto you from the Father. And you go home and read John 14 through 17, find out this is all accurate. And he says this. Now, they were sad because he was going away. They couldn't understand again on a head trip what he meant. But listen, he said, it's expedient that I go away. If I don't go away, the Comforter won't come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. But hear this, when he comes, I will come back with him and will make my home in your heart, and my Father will come, and the three of us will settle down in you, and make our abode in you. That's God's promise. And we will live in you. We'll be in you, and you'll be in us. And there won't be any temporal, spatial distances. There won't be any back outs in time. You'll be with me at all times, and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now hear what John 14 says. The world, when that happens, the world will not be able to see me. But you will be able to see me. Now, none of us see Jesus with our physical eyes. 
But as I was preaching yesterday, when the veil of our heart is rent, we can see Jesus with the eyes of our spirit and hear him with the ears of our heart. And so in that passage he promises, I will come and make myself real. The King James says, I will come and manifest myself to you. What it says in the original, very strongly in good modern speech translations, when I and my Father come back in the Holy Spirit, and the world isn't able to see us anymore, but you'll be able to see us, I will make myself real to you. And he makes himself real to me. And I know that he makes himself real to many of you, and I'm here to suggest to the rest of you, that he can become more real than your skin. Because the, uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.30, how close are you to God? We're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. That's mighty close. And here's even closer, 1 Corinthians 6.17, he that is joined unto the Lord, and we are, is one spirit. Isn't that a great verse? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now that Christ has been born in your heart. If you're on a head trip and you know nothing about your spirit and you're not in touch with the deep inner voice, as the Bible says over and over and over and over and over again, for example, seven times in Revelation 2 and 3, he's writing to seven churches, not seven worldly lounges, seven churches. And he says, let him that has ears to hear, hear what the spirit is saying in the churches. How many times did Jesus say that when he was teaching the multitudes here? He's not talking about these ears. How stupid we are. And you know my friend Walter Leckler, who runs a brilliant uh, therapy unit. There are 300 people waiting to get into the thing in the Black Forest of Germany. Walter was suicidal from the time he was 40 to 45 years of age. He's 58 years of age now and one of the most beautiful human beings I know, a surgeon and a psychiatrist. And he tells his people, and you have to know Walter, this sounds kind of crass when you hear it, but he's a beautiful human being. He says, you know how I make my living? Off your stupidity. He says, you're not sick, you're stupid. Well, isn't that the truth? And you know, here we are, and we allow ourselves to fall back into the old snare of old dead religion, and we don't use these senses that God's given. Let him that has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying in the churches. And we ignore that because our hearts aren't open. All it takes to open your heart is willingness, a desire for God to put everything without anything held back into his hand. That's the only thing that will open your heart, is love for God. That opens your heart doesn't depend on your IQ. Then he says, let him that hath ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying in the churches. Then you can start hearing with your heart. Beautiful way to hear. That's the way we bring up the king. When he's born in the manger of our hearts, when he's born in Bethlehem like he was in Georg's heart at the annunciation of Gabriel the angel, then it becomes your stewardship to see to it that Jesus becomes flesh in the 20th century, not 2,000 years ago. There's no way on a head trip that I can reach back 2,000 years while you try to imagine what it was like to fellowship with Julius Caesar. There's an illustration for you. Or Mark Antony or Cleopatra. You might fantasize certain things, especially with Cleopatra, but it wouldn't be reality, see, because it's 2,000 years removed. And your head can't reach back that far. You can't reach back with your head and touch Jesus Christ. He comes to you through years and centuries of tradition that's bent him all out of shape so that you get a prissy Jesus that we heard Wayne describe yesterday, who's sallow-cheeked and looks like he's been sucking pickles and on a very lean diet and all the rest of it, and not a person you'd especially like to know at all, one of those horrible pieces of medieval art that looks like he'd sunken in a ship a hundred years ago and just surfaced. Now, I don't want a Savior like that. That's not real. And yet that's the Savior that many Christians have, unfortunately. You can have a real Savior because he's there closer than your skin, one spirit with you, and makes himself real to you, praise God. And when he makes himself real to you, nobody can ever take him away from you out of your heart. Now, to get out another problem, which is a big problem in the church today, and kind of relates what I'm saying tonight to the message yesterday, if you look at Galatians 4, even tonight I had a really good visit with a brother out in the hall about this matter. Now, we're living in a day a tremendous accelerated change. I think every perceptive student of these times realizes that something big is happening today in the things of the Spirit. This seems to be one of those times of a great quantum leap forward in the things of God. For example, about six years ago I was over here at Princeton, New Jersey with my friend Bruce Larson, who's a dear brother, and right out there in the cutting edge and his friend Keith Miller. 
when they ran the Experimental Institute for Human Development. That's where I first met my friend Walter Leckler and my friend Jess Lair and a whole lot of other beautiful people. And what was that Experimental Institute for Human Development all about? It was based on this premise that there is a quantum leap forward in the spiritual development or evolution of the new humanity, the one new man in Christ. And that we want to find out what God wants us to do, and we were there to listen to the Spirit. 300 people strong from 38 states and five foreign countries. And Bruce has written some terrific books. I'd heartily recommend them to you, like uh, The uh, Relational Revolution, The Meaning and Mystery of Being Human, The One and Only You. Those are all great books by Bruce Larson. Another one on the theme that I preached yesterday, Please Love Me, by Keith Miller. Well, now that all has to do with the accelerated change that's taking place. Do you know what happened to us when we were at the Experimental Institute for Human Development? We didn't sit around and talk and rap and have committee meetings and subcommittee and sub-subcommittee meetings. That's boring as all get out. I thank God I get into very little of that now, whereas I used to spend a lot of my energy in it in my early ministry. Now we sat around holding hands with one another and experiencing some things. Now, I'm not going into all the details tonight, but we experienced what's known as scream therapy. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're an age that's told, for example, we can't touch one another uh, and you can't hug one another, and thank God a lot of that's beginning to break down. That's part of the accelerated change. So we find out we can touch one another, we can hug one another, and be blessed immeasurably by it, and that we've been a people who've been deprived of a sense of touch ever since we were born, and that's tragic. It does bad things to you, and then you're always reaching out for it unconsciously in the wrong way. Whereas if you can have the warm walls of people around you who love you and are mutuality people whose faces light up when they see you, as my friend Jess Lair would put it, and who do not have an agenda for your improvement. And that's wonderful. Then it just does wonders for you. It makes you feel good. You know, I've sat with my arm around uh, my friends in Melbourne when we meet in our small group down there. And uh, we have some heavy things go on in the group, and it blesses us no end. Well, we were doing that in Princeton six years ago. And I saw people begin to understand that you don't have to go around always keeping a stiff upper lip. You don't always have to be in control. What a blessing to lose control once in a while. Hallelujah. And you can see some of that in the meeting tonight. We certainly lost control of the meeting when people were starting to dance in the aisles. I think that's questionable. <laughs> I love to see it. I praise God for it. And I do a lot of that wild stuff myself. Now, I think we ought to do more of it. That's what I'm saying, is that we need to lose control. Well, you say, I feel like screaming. Well, then why don't you find a place where you can do it? It's that simple. You say, oh, my, man, they might lock me up in a funny bin. Well, then you'd have a good place to scream, but why don't you do it? You have a greater chance of getting locked up in it if you don't. Now, you can't just go out and sit on your front steps, probably, and frighten your neighbors half to death by practicing scream therapy. But you know what happens when you start screaming? You cleanse your heart. What does an animal do when it's feeling bad or it's wounded? It screams. It cries. Why can't we scream and cry? Because our culture tells us, do not scream and do not cry. It's unseemly. It means you've lost control and you're no longer civilized. Well, that's the world's idea. I don't care about that. I want to find out what's good for me. If I'm going to bring up the king in me, I've got to find an environment that's good for him to grow up in. Amen? So I've got to find out what God's saying to me. And I've seen some straight-laced, uptight deacons down in Melbourne and elsewhere who said, Oh, mercy, scream therapy in there. Homes are racked by all kinds of youth revolt. Their kids grow up spiritually. If they were suddenly transformed, they'd appear in the form of a corkscrew. They're so screwed up. And yet they keep right on loading the rules on them, hitting them over the head with the stone tablets because they're scared to death to depart from what's familiar and where they're in control. You know what Jesus did when he was afraid and when he was frightened? You say, oh, Jesus was never frightened, he was never afraid, he was 100% human, and I beg to differ with you. Listen to the word of God tonight. And if you have a fight, you don't have it with me, this is God's word. So don't waste my energies fighting with me. Fight with the word of God. You'll find that a tough task. Hebrews 5, 7. It says, in the days of his flesh, he prayed with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Praise God, he was human, aren't you glad? I am. Now you see what happens, and you can see it happening right here tonight. Some people are not so sure they're glad about that, because they've got a rigid plastic Jesus sitting up there on the shelf in the pantheon of their little temple of religion, and Jesus would never be afraid, and he'd never show weakness, baloney. When he went to Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept. 
And he wasn't praising God and dancing in circles, shouting and saying, Hallelujah, Lazarus is dead and I'm glad because I'm supposed to praise God 100 uh, times out of 100. He knew that there was a time to cry and a time to praise God, and he had enough sense in his spirit to know when to praise and when to cry. Thank God for that. And may the Lord give us that kind of sensitivity. And when we don't have that kind of sensitivity and our heart is loaded up with all kinds of junk, then somebody comes to us who's really hurting, although they usually can smell it afar off and won't come. But if they do make the mistake of coming to us, then we brutalize them because we have no sensitivity in the spirit as to where that person is. Now, the Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. I'm talking about matters not of the head but of the heart tonight. Do you want to get your heart opened up? Well, now listen, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. That's what we want to do. Jesus said, you'll see me. I want to see God. I've got to have a pure heart. How do I get that? By living by the rules? No, that'll make me much more impure in heart. You know how I get pure in heart? Well, there's another law there that was quoted tonight, and it's this, blessed are the poor in spirit. The riches of the kingdom of God belong to them. When I realize my poverty and I'm getting to the end of my rope, which is what we've been preaching here, then grace can take over, see? Now... Listen to James 4 about how to purify your heart. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and pure, purify your heart, you schizoids. You say, it doesn't say that in my King James Bible. Well, it means the same thing. Did you know that? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. A double-minded man's unstable in all of his ways. That's a split personality, see? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. How can I purify my heart? Go home and read James 4. I'm quoting it. Be afflicted and mourn and howl and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. Do a little screaming. Do a little crying. Do you good. It'll purify your heart and enable you to see God. How about that? Now, you know what you're going to do, some of you? I know what you'll do. This scares the living daylights out of people. You know who it especially scares, I'm sorry to say, Christian workers. Man, I can almost feel the negative vibrations when I stand on the platform and ever say things like this to Christian workers. Because they're on such a head trip and they've been to seminary. That's a bad thing sometimes. And they've got it got all systematized and they know what he's going to do at 9.05 a.m. on Tuesday morning and at 10.05 a.m. on Wednesday morning because their theology tells them. See, God's totally predictable and they've eliminated all surprises. So when they start hearing these things, it scares the living daylights out of them. You know, they can sit there and crank their wheels forever and ever and ever, ad infinitum, to eternity, and it won't do them one blooming bit of good, because the things I'm talking about cannot be thought through. They must be experienced. And when you experience it, then you can say, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I remember at that conclave that we had in Princeton, the Experimental Institute, and I say that the age is speeding up in this pace of change, that when we had that thing, that there was a Presbyterian lady missionary, a mi minister rather, not a missionary, a lady minister in the Presbyterian Church, 29 years of age, and uh, Walter was doing his scream therapy sessions to teach people that it's okay to scream. You know, what a lot of us need is permission. We need our peers and friends around us. We need some mutuality friends to tell us, hey, it's okay to cry. It's okay to scream once in a while. Get the garbage out. That's a great way to dump the garbage. Amen. It sure is, and the Bible advises it, and I've just quoted it to you from James, the fourth chapter. And incidentally, you can find it all through the Bible. David said, I poured out my complaint unto the Lord. That's a good thing to do, pour out the garbage unto the Lord. Well, this Presbyterian lady missionary, now there are a lot of Atheists, humanists, secularists, all kinds of people at that particular experimental institute. But this happened to be a Christian lady, a minister. And she was absolutely in agony. You could see it written on her face. And so when Walter began to explain some of the things that I'm explaining tonight, he said, now who wants to try it? And she was one of the first ones to try it. And, uh, you know, you all join hands in a session like that and uh, do some corporate screaming. And it's some sound you'll never forget. And the interesting thing is that people stop all at once. And yet there are some people that it resonates the pain in their heart and they keep right on going with it, see? Now you'd have to see it to understand it. And she was one of them. And then Walter went after she'd been doing some screaming and he held her in his arms, which is great. Because that tells you it's okay to scream and I still love you. Just like it's okay to cry and I still love you. And we need to be bonded and we need to be held and we need to be loved. Everybody's got a body that needs some touching, some more than others. And so he did that to this lady. 
And then he suggested, and Walter's a devout, beautiful Christian, a spirit-filled Christian, but he utterly astounded her by saying to her, and there were about 35 people in the inner circle, he said, now go around this circle and say, and he used an atrocious four-letter word that not even I would use from the platform. He said, say to that person this thing. And she said, oh, I can't possibly say that. And she was astounded that he suggested it. He said, all right, say something that's appropriate, like get off my back. Well, she started around that circle, and at first it was kind of play-acting or role-playing, but this minister said, get off my back to the first person, the second, the third, the fourth, with increasing intensity. By the time she got to the fifth through the tenth people, she was meaning business, and she wasn't seeing the strangers who were seated in front of her. They were weeping with her. She was seeing the people who had done her dirt and put her down and hindered her growth and sawed her legs and arms off and chucked her into a straight jacket. And by that time, by the time she got around that circle with 35 people, she was a new woman, I'll tell you that. And her face was lit up like a Christmas tree, and I watched her the rest of that week, and she was transformed. You know how she got transformed? By experience. That's how, that's how she got transformed. You don't get transformed by sitting in Bible classes or conferences even as good as this one has been. When you hear these things, ask God for the guts and the courage to go out and put some of them into effect, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what ones to try. Listen to him and do what he saith unto you. When Mary wanted Jesus to make some wine, she said to those servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Amen. You say, well, I'm afraid to do it because I make, might make mistakes. Lose control and make a few mistakes and let God lead you. He'll even take your mistakes and build them into a fabric of success. <clears throat> now the age is speeding up in spiritual change. Morton Kelsey, professor of theology at Notre Dame University until recently, an Episcopalian minister, and a good writer, a Jungian analyst, a great man, said this, you know, I find young people going through the same struggles, remember that he's a psychiatrist, I find young people going through the same struggles that I did, only I find them going through them as a group 20 years earlier, amen. You know what that means? It means God's accelerating the change of spirit in the body of Christ today, which ought to encourage every one of us. Change is accelerating, and we're beginning in one of those quantum leaps, one of those times when we reach a new plateau of spiritual growth. Listen to this statement from Carl Jung. No thinking person will wish to claim that the present state of affairs represents a durable end state. On the contrary, Everyone is convinced that the tempo of change and transition has been speeded up immeasurably. Everything has become fragmented and dissolved. Do you hear that tonight from this great mind, one of the great minds and spirits of this century? Everything has become fragmented and dissolved. I told my friends in Melbourne, and I preached this across the country, and every other person who has any prophetic gift at all knows this. But this is a time when God's shaking down everything that can be shaken down, and he's going to shake it harder than we've ever seen it before. Why is God doing that? He's doing it because, well, listen to it. Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And these words yet once more signify the removing of things that are shaken, three-dimensional things, as of things that are made, so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain, we've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear because our God's a consuming fire. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. God's shaking everything down so that we can find those unshakable things that are within us. You have an unshakable anchor in the person of the king who's in the Bethlehem of your heart. He's also in heaven, an anchor sure and steadfast within the veil whether the forerunner is for us entered a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, the Lord Jesus. And God wants us to know these things. They're things of the heart. They're not things of the head. You can never find out about Melchizedek by simply using your head. You have to let the Holy Spirit show you who Melchizedek is and make him real to you in your heart. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Listen to what Jung goes on to say. Everything is being dissolved. It is impossible to see how a higher synthesis could take place in any of the spiritual organizations, I'll explain this in a moment, that still survive. It's impossible to see how a higher synthesis could take place in any of the spiritual organizations that still survive without their having to be modified to an almost unendurable or an intolerable degree. Now, what's he mean by that? He means this. I've had many conversations. None of us have all the answers. We're waiting on God for the answers. But I never realized until in my recent studies that ancient Catholic theologians in the early days of the church used to prophesy and teach and preach a wonderful thing. Roman Catholic theologians. 
They're also the theologians of the Greek Orthodox Church because it goes back that far. And they taught that the day would come in the history of the church when the hierarchy would evaporate. In fact, one of the great prophets well over 500 years ago, back in the 1500s, taught this. He said, first came the age of the Father, the Old Testament. And then with the arrival of the Lord Jesus came the age of the Son. And he said, someday, remember 500 years ago, not today in my day, will be the age of the Spirit. Amen. And in that day, when the age of the Spirit arrives, then the hierarchy of the church will begin to evaporate, and the old structures will fall because God will shake them down, because every man will come to know, little by little, Christ in him, and begin to know the mystery of the indwelling Christ, so that he'll be in direct organic contact with God and be guided by God. My friends, I'm here tonight to suggest to you that that's what's happening in its early stages before our very eyes. That God is evolving a people of the Spirit. It had to happen. God prophesied that it would happen. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said through his apostle Paul in the fourth chapter of Ephesians? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Now, I just pause for this moment to say this. For many years... In the tradition of evangelicalism, there were no apostles and there were no prophets around at all. And so it was only pastors, evangelists, and teachers. That's tragic. You know why that's tragic? Because pastors are a marvelous office. They're shepherds. They look after God's people. They try to help young Christians grow in the Lord. That's tremendous. They feed the flock of God and take the oversight thereof. And I have nothing but admiration for spirit-filled pastors who teach people the grace of God. I have nothing but disdain for Galatian heretics who teach people legalism. That's not New Testament Christianity. It's nothing but warmed, warmed over Judaism. Now, a true pastor will lead his people on in the grace of God and show them what they already are in Jesus Christ. He'll show them the finished work of Christ. He'll not be teaching them do, do, do. He'll be teaching them this is what Jesus has done, and this is what you are in Christ. And he'll take care of the young lambs. Thank God for pastors. You know how he'll do that? Well, Jack Sanford, in his excellent book, The Elijah Task, which has to do with the prophet's uh, position in the church, said this, that it is the pastor's task to lead people by still waters, to give them food in small bites and to see to it that the sheep don't get indigestion. Well, amen, that's a good description of the pastor's task. But, he said, it is the prophet's task to lead people by angry mountain streams and to dump a whole load of hay on them at once and to give them a bad case of indigestion. Hallelujah, that's true. That's what I'm doing to you this weekend. I feel good doing it. You know why I feel good doing it? There'll be some people who've been conditioned and brainwashed for far too long. You know, I can always tell them, and they're good folks, and they love God, and I love them, and we learn very slowly, all of us. But they'll come around and say, Oh, man, I'm mentally exhausted. I can't possibly remember all that you've said. Well, neither can I. <laughs> Welcome to the club. I don't remember it five minutes after I finish it. And then some of them are chronic note takers, and I have nothing against taking notes. I think that's great, but don't ever try to find an outline in one of my messages that isn't there. And they'll say, I couldn't keep up. I was trying to take notes. Well, don't try. That'll teach you to throw your notepad aside and only put down certain relevant notes that the Holy Spirit impresses on you. And I always tell people this, that when you're listening to somebody with a prophetic message in particular, and he's letting all the guns loose at once, think of it as a spaghetti fight. What's yours will stick to you. <laughs> don't worry about the rest. You don't have to worry about it. You have a promise. God says, I'll bring to your remembrance the things that you need. So don't strain and struggle so hard. Now, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why did he give these offices? To perfect the saints in the work of the ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, we all know that, but did you notice what the latter part of that passage says? It says he gave them, he gave those offices until, until, notice the untils in the Bible, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a mature man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. I give you a free... Uh, interpretation of that tonight. My friend Ralph Nault, who has a great prophetic message up in, uh, uh, ministry up in northern New England, said to his believers, and he's touched hundreds and hundreds of lives, Ralph is a devout, spirit-filled Roman Catholic prophet, and he said to his people, 
You know, when you're first saved, certainly you need to go to Bible class every single week and two times a week and the rest of it and keep up a diet of meetings and all the rest of that. But he said, later on, you don't need to be doing that all the while. He said, because it'll be stored in your heart and it'll be written in the fleshy walls of your heart and you will have studied the Bible intensively yourself and you will have memorized large portions of it and God the Holy Spirit will have impregnated it into your spirit and you won't constantly need to hear it rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and you'll be able to go out and live and share the light and be lights in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation shining as lights in the world. Amen to that. So today in the church we grope for the will of God and we say, well, what about authority and what about submission and the rest of it? And some people have gone off the deep end on that trip. But you know, there are people, now hear it carefully tonight, every one of us when we're young in the Lord and we're first saved, need some spiritual guides around us. Ask God the Holy Spirit to give you discernment if you're a young Christian to get a good spiritual father and mother and some people around you who can help you and will help build you up in the grace of God and the finished work of Christ. Do not get into performance-oriented Christianity. Get into the finished work of Christ. Listen to someone, some good pastor or teacher who teaches the grace of God and feed your heart and spirit a diet of that. It'll help you save lots of years in grief and wandering in the wilderness of spiritual defeat while you try to do what Jesus has already done for you. Find somebody like that. You see, that's what the first few verses of Galatians 4 has to do with. It says we're under tutors and governors until the time appointed of our Father. Now, in other words, you don't just have a child born into your home and say, now shift for yourself and I hope you get a job tomorrow. The budget's a bit short. You take care of him. That's what you do with new Christians, too. You help them along. But you don't look upon them as your possession, please note. And especially if you're a Christian worker, you don't own another human being. And you're not there to put an authority trip on them and make them your chattel forever so that you can tell them when to blow their nose and when to change their handkerchief. God did not put you there for that reason. He taught you, He put you there so that you could teach them to use their spiritual muscles so that they could grow up in God. And that's what the New Testament solidly teaches. Now, I have a great admiration for one of my very dear friends. We've labored together in the Lord's battles for well over 20 years, and our hearts are knit together like David and Jonathan's. We have different ministries in the body of Christ. His ministry is more of a mightily anointed pastor, an apostolic ministry. He's touched, multiplied thousands of lives, and he's seen great cells of believers grow up all over this country and in other parts of the world. And I have a great admiration for him because you know what he did through those years? He laid solid foundations in the grace of God. He was a man that lived by revelation, and he taught other people to listen to God. But during the times when they were growing up, he said, You be follower of me as I am follower of Christ. Be co-imitator of me as I am co-imitator of Christ. And he taught them. And they looked at him and they could see Jesus in flesh and blood in his life because the man exudes the love of God and the river of love was flowing out of his inner being. But he had great, great, huge numbers of young people in his organization. But you know what he did? He used to bring me in to teach in those days. He still does. But from the earliest days, he'd bring me in to teach. He'd never try to modify my message in any sense. He'd never try to put any clamps on it. He'd never try to stop my radicalism. I'd just get up there and say whatever the Spirit of God told me to say with holy boldness. And you know how a large segment of those young people, they'd come to the first meeting. He didn't force them to come. A large seg segment of those young believers would come to my meetings, and they'd think that they were hearing somebody who fell off the moon and hurt his head. They'd look at me like they thought I was totally nuts. Talk about the Garden of Fruits, they thought I was one of them. And so they'd go out shaking their head, wagging their head, and they, they would say, this isn't the way pastor teaches. Oh, yes, it was, but they didn't know it. They were too early in their Christian life, and they couldn't receive what I was giving. How did I feel about that? I felt good about it, and especially as the years have grow grown on. You know why? Because I know the power of living seed. I've lived long enough to see what living seed can do, and I've seen some people that I've taught that looked as blank as a stone wall when I taught them, and you'd think that they never would receive a thing, and some of them have viciously fought me because intuitively they knew there was a cross in this message, and they didn't want to go to it. And so they'd fight me. I just came down from northern New England where I had a lot of enemies like that. You know what they did in this recent conference? Many of them turned out in large delegations and their hearts were open. You know what had happened? The years had passed. The seed had sprung up. They'd gone through some fires. They'd been defeated. They'd found out that performance-oriented Christianity doesn't work. They'd been wandering in the wilderness. They'd been in the wilderness of spiritual defeat. And now, praise God, their hearts are open for something better. And they're hearing. And I've seen that happen in that other work. You know what that is? That's body life. That's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers working together to build up the saints. But there comes a magic line in the life of each person where God's going to jerk you away from all your proppings if you haven't received it already, if you have a heart for God. If you don't, you can stay right there in the wilderness. But if you've got a heart for God, 
There'll come a time when you'll cross a new river, a new boundary line in your spiritual experience. It won't be the Red Sea which you crossed when you first got saved. This time it's going to be the Jordan, praise God. And you're going into Canaan. And you know what happens when you get into Canaan? Many things happen when you get into Canaan, but I'll tell you one thing. The manna ceases. You know what manna is? It's the milk of the Word. God drops it right in front of you, and all you have to do is go out and pick it up. And the minute the Israelis crossed the Jordan River after 40 years of wandering and the new generation entered in, you know what the Bible says in Joshua 5? The manna ceased, and they ate the old corn of the land that year. New food! What's old corn? It's resurrection food. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And you'll get new fruit. What is it? It's the fruit of the indwelling, glorified Christ. You'll be able to hear God clearer in your heart. He'll begin to guide you from inwardly. You'll begin to listen to your intuitions. You'll be able to bring up the King. And you'll start growing up in the Lord. And the love of God flowing out of your heart. And you'll find a lot of teachers that blessed you way back there. And you go through a stage now here tonight. Because I see my friend going through this, and I've gone through it myself. When your spiritual children will turn around, and it can be either mild or very severe, just like it can in bringing up teenagers and adolescents. If you brought them up and gradually relaxed your control on them, so that you don't try to control somebody who's 12, 13, 14 years old, like you did somebody who was 5 and 6 years of age. You've gradually relaxed your controls and even forced them to make some decisions, even if they made mistakes. You've taught them to use their spiritual muscles. You know, God gave us the wisdom, and I say it to his everlasting praise, to do that with our sons, and we never had a pronounced youth revolt in our home because we were their friends while they were growing up, and now they're out in life on their own. And the same thing happens spiritually. The time will come when your own spiritual children will turn around and kick you in the ankles or in the shins a little bit. You know why? Because you can never become your own person, and you can never become an adult until you break away from some of the old props and the people who've held you up and helped you along and then when you get down the line a little bit further, you'll turn around and say, well, I kicked him in the shins, but I had to do it. And, and I realize how much input she had in my life and how much input he had in my life. And I'm everlastingly grateful to them. And I love them deeply. And you just come right around, but you go through the stage of growth. You hear what I'm saying tonight? Don't be surprised when it happens. It's a great thing. Now, how do you bring up the king? And then we'll have to close with this. Come back to Matthew, the first chapter. Learn to hear the language of the heart. Don't try to hold on to people who ought to keep growing. And listen, for pity's sake, Quit playing God in other people's lives. Now, I know it's easy for me to stand here and say that tonight, but you'll never quit playing God in other people's lives until you've gone through some fire. We see somebody making a mistake, and right away we say, Oh, my, 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 the fellow's sinning. The dear girl is sinning. Now we know the Bible says, Do not sin. So obviously, this is logical deduction. I've been brainwashed in this. This is what we call a syllogism, major premise, minor premise, conclusion. What the major premise is, she's sinning. Minor premise is, the Bible says don't sin, and so the only possible conclusion is that I'm to straighten her out. So we rush in where angels indeed fear to tread, and say, as an usher once said in his great zeal to seat my mother in a church, let me sew you to a sheet. <laughs> and that's what we try to do with young believers. Because merciful bomb sites, we can't have them making mistakes and sinning. We want them to be like us, who never sin and never make mistakes. So the only obvious conclusion is, prop the poor soul up. So we leap in there and we wonder why we end up with a blob instead of a living human being. Why they look so put down and so wilted. We're like people who go out and plant their gardens one day and go out and dig them up the next day to find out why they haven't grown. And then God says, why you jerk? You say, why God would never say that to me. If you open your ears, he'll say worse than that to you. I'll guarantee it. God will say, why, you jerk. Didn't you ever notice in the Bible? He's, and he may try to reason with you. Most of us learn the hard way, don't we? So he'll first speak to us and he'll say, did you ever notice that Peter had a great thing about making mistakes? And he was supremely confident in what he could do. So I said to my disciples in that day, when the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Now notice that Jesus isn't surprised. He does not have his tranquilizers. I don't read anything about that. That he jerked out his bottle of tranquil tranquilizers and went, Good heavens, you're going to make a mistake. He didn't swallow them and say, You're grief to my soul. You put me under terrible stress. You're going to make a mistake. My father tells me, Peter, you're going to fail me. And so are these other cats. Now, he didn't say that, did he? He just said, as far as I know, in pretty well modulated voice, he said, When the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times because smite the shepherd 
and the sheep will be scattered. Now, what kind of a shepherd is this? He was an all-powerful shepherd. How is it he's going to allow himself to be smitten and the sheep to be scattered? Because it was good for the sheep to get scattered. Boy, I get so sick of some of these legalistic pastors, and I'll tell you, one time I scandalized a bunch of them. I said to God, how... You hear what they're saying. You know very well that that's not the truth. They think of God's people as a bunch of dummies who are to remain forever sheep. Nothing but sheep. You think God wants a bunch of woolly fat people in heaven? They were always talking about we've got to protect these sheep. We feed these sheep. We corral these sheep. We keep false prophets like you away from them. So God gave me the perfect answer. The Holy Spirit has great answers. He said, you read them Romans, the 8th chapter, along about, I think it's the 37th verse. For thy sake, get this, <laughs> boy, oh boy, did I enjoy preaching this. For thy sake we are killed all day long and counted as sheep for the slaughter. You know what God wants to do with your fat, mature sheep? Drag them to the slaughterhouse. I said, how would you like to have me bombing through your sheepfold and grab some of your fat sheep and drag them off to the slaughterhouse? That happens to be what the Word of God says. That's exactly what God wants to do with some people who've been waddling around fat and loaded with wool for 40 years in the wilderness. He'd like to grab them by their wool and throw them right into the slaughterhouse. I'm not kidding you. For thy sake we're killed all the day long and counted as sheep for the slaughter. Do you know that that's where New Testament Christianity begins? Is that the cross? That's not the end. That's the beginning. Take up your cross now and follow me. That's when the sheep dies and becomes a king before God. Now, that may scare the living daylights out of you at night, but if it does, that's your problem. I've had many things God's done to me, and he scared me, and I've complained to him, and you can do the same thing. <laughs> so he said, you're going to flop. Now, that's wonderful to be told you're going to have a major flop in your life. Notice that Jesus doesn't have our definition of success. He says, I've run this little Bible school now for three and a half years. I had the multitudes following me. It's degenerated down to this little handful of people. I've got 12 here. One's a traitor. My, isn't that wonderful? Looks great, doesn't it? Isn't that a great church? Seen all these charismatic miracles and everything, now he's got 11 left. And he says, uh, now I'm going to be smitten and you're all going to be scattered. And they all protest, and Peter, of course, more vocally because he was so extroverted, than the others, and he said, all these other guys may fail, but can count on old number one. And so Peter had the blessed experience of standing at the fire, warming his hands under attack and in deep stress and saying for the third time that night in a very loud voice and with many colorful words, I don't know the man, and swearing. And then he heard a distant rooster crow. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now you know what happened when Peter went out and wept bitterly and denied the Lord with cursing and swearing. God the Father fell off his throne in heaven and said the cause is lost, it's down the tubes. Send another flood. He didn't say anything of the sort. He knew it was going to happen from eternity past. You think God gets himself into a lather because you fall on your face like Peter did? Not at all. He knows it's going to happen. You know who gets a big surprise when we fall on our face? Not God. Me. You. That's where the shock comes in and what comes out of it? You lose confidence in your flesh. Hallelujah. You find a better way to live. Amen? You start listening to your heart. Come back to Matthew 1 now and we'll try to wind this down. I've given you many things to think about, but when you start living out of your heart, God will start speaking to you. How? In still, small voice and deep impressions of the heart. Now, don't expect to hear a voice like mine or somebody who's seated next to you like a physical voice. Sometimes God speaks that way, but most often he does not. He speaks in your intuitions. He speaks in the deep impressions of the heart, a deep feeling for the terrain spiritually. As you live in spiritual terrain, you become more familiar with it. Lawrence Vanderpost tells a marvelous story about the Kalahari tribesmen of South Africa. He said he was amazed how those people could take off into hundreds of miles of absolutely trackless wilderness that all looked exactly the same to him. Without a map or a compass, they didn't even know there was such a thing as a map or a compass. He loved those Kalahari tribesmen. And one day he got up the courage to ask them how under the sun they could go way out there for day's journey on a hunt and come back like homing pigeons. And when he asked them the question, he said, as only a primitive people, unhindered by the 
trips of civilization could do. He said, those people knew how to laugh from their very deep gut. And he said, they just fell on the ground laughing at my stupidity. That funny question struck them so, so peculiar. How could they go out there and do that and come back? He said, they thought that was the funniest thing they were ever asked. And he said, when they f finally got done laughing, they said, why, don't you realize, and he didn't, that no two blades of grass are exactly the same. No two hillocks, no two hummocks, no two trees, no two shrubs are exactly the same. We always know where we are because we know our terrain. Amen. And when you live in the land of the Spirit little by little, the grass begins to look different. The hillocks and hummocks look different. You get a sense of where God is and you get a sense of where you are and praise God who you are. And you can find your way back home like a homing pigeon. How else does God speak to bring up the king? Now, the king's been born in your heart. It's your stewardship, just like it was Mary and Joseph's stewardship, to find an environment in which that inner you, the real self, the real deep you, the eternal Christ, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, the true self, can grow. You'll hear it in the ways I've suggested, and then you'll hear it this way. In dreams. Supposing Joseph had been trying to figure it out with his head. He's engaged to a girl much younger than he is, according to tradition, Mary. And he knows that he hasn't been sleeping with her, and she's pregnant. And by the way, you can imagine what happens when you begin to walk in the spirit to your blooming reputation. Get the message without my giving you a long commentary? If you want to hang on to your reputation, stay in the wilderness. But I'll tell you this right now, it isn't worth hanging on to. God will give you a heavenly, glorious reputation to be called after his name, and if you suffer with him, you reign with him. Hallelujah. Well, Joseph was thinking in his head, I ought to put her away, and uh, I think that even though she got into trouble, she must be a... I really know Mary, and she's a beautiful girl, and she's got a beautiful heart, just like she has a beautiful face, and he's thinking this to himself, and then he falls asleep. And when you're asleep, God can especially sleep, uh, speak to you because your conscious mind, the great controlling influence, the ego mind, is unconscious hallelujah and so what happens verse 20 Matthew 1 happens but while he thought on these things behold while he thought on these things behold the angel of the Lord appeared to him where in a dream and he said unto Joseph son of David fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit so he took Mary for his wife. Jesus was born. And so wise men come after Jesus begins to grow and probably is just some place under two years of age and he's in Bethlehem. They come to Herod to find out what town he's been born in. Herod doesn't know, of course, but he's threatened by the fact that a king may have been born and he wants to find him and kill him. And you know the story of Matthew, the second chapter. And so notice what happens with the wise men. Here's how to bring up the king and protect the king. Verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return because Herod had said to them, come back and tell me where he is and I'll go and worship him. But the wise men were warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod and, Herod and they departed their own country another way. And so the king's life was preserved. God will tell you through messages in your heart that there are some things in your environment that are not good for the growing king and for the true self who's within you and to avoid them to do an end run on them. In other words, bluntly, to stay away from people that aren't good for you. You hear what I'm saying tonight? That's one of the great laws in the kingdom. Don't be with people who are always putting you down, who are always trying to put you in a straitjacket, who are always saying, let me show you into a shroud, who always want to cut off your arms and legs to fit you into their concept of what you want to be. How are we going to help the king to grow up? Joseph gives us a perfect example. Verse 13 of the second chapter of Moses. And when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph again in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee. Run! Not time to fight now, time to flee. Run from this situation into Egypt. Why? Because Herod's seeking to kill the child. And be there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. We have a Herod in our life who seeks the old self that is determined, the Ishmael, to put Isaac down, the flesh to put Christ down. Listen to the message of the heart as to how to avoid that happening in your life. God speaks again in verse 19. But when Herod was dead, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For their dead which sought the young child's life, and he arose and went. But in verse 22, when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream. He turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Just about one year ago now, when God was winding down a phase of my ministry at Tabernacle Church in Melbourne, where there were many people who responded to the message of the cutting edge, and going on and knowing the indwelling Christ, and thank God for them, they're a courageous, beautiful bunch of people. There were many people who were reactionary and very legalistic and very dedicated to the other side of things. And so every Saturday night before I'd go to church for three straight Sundays in August, I had a dream. In the first dream, I was back in my old dead legalistic Baptist church in Erie, Pennsylvania, where I was raised. In the dream, I was in an upper room off the back auditorium, and there wasn't a woman anywhere in sight. It was a men's meeting, and they were going through a disgusting shuffle type of dance, watching one another's feet. It was boring beyond description. And a handful of us decided we couldn't stand it anymore, and we snuck out the side door and left them doing their shuffle dance and went downstairs in the back auditorium, and it was incredibly dirty. And I said to myself in the dream, good heavens, that they lost even the niceties of janitorial service. And there was an old deacon who used to love my ministry in the true church in Erie, and he was standing in the shadows. And God was telling me through that that there were people there who, like Nicodemus, were followers of what I was teaching in the darkness. What did God tell me in that dream? Your ministry in this place is coming to an end. The next Saturday night I dreamed another dream. This time I was at a great camp meeting, and everybody was dancing and singing and shouting and praising God, and the songs were tremendous. And all of a sudden it split up into a whole bunch of small groups, and each one had their doctrinal placards up saying, We've got the truth, come to us. And disunity set in, and I was very distressed by it in the dream. And I said to God, What shall I do? And the great voice of God said to me in that dream, give it time, give it time. The third Saturday night before I went back to church, I had another such dream in which God just appeared and told me the same thing. In essence, he just said, look, your ministry here is coming to an end. And I began to realize that that was true. And then I had to work it out through many, many painful experiences, the same as Peter and others and Joseph had to work it out in their experience. What I'd like to establish to your heart tonight is that there was a time in my life when I didn't pay any attention to dreams at all because I was so theologically conditioned in my head, in my church, from the time I could remember anything I knew the gospel and then went to seminary and all the rest of it that I had it all between my ears, but I was very dissatisfied and very hungry. And early in my life, way back in the early 50s, I surrendered my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then God began to change my whole life and to show me the things I'm teaching tonight. And more in recent years, he said, listen, there's a great way that I speak to men through their hearts, and a whole lot of the Bible is written on it. And if you were to take out all the dreams in the Bible, you'd have a much, much, much smaller book. And I can speak to you in dreams. And I'm here tonight to tell you he sure can. I'd just like to say this. Listen to what God's telling you in your heart. Don't live between the small space between your ears. That's a very small apartment for any of us. God wants you living in the Spirit. How big is the Spirit? Infinite is right. Infinite. Without boundaries. You have a great inheritance. The music of heaven is there, like it was in Wayne's waterfall in the dream he told us about last night. The glories of God are there. God will give you hope and joy and peace. For example, in January of this year, he gave me a great dream on the king. Only this wasn't on the birth of the king, it was on the renewal of the king. When you go through the so-called crisis of midlife, as I have passed through it, a later crisis in your spiritual growth, then God renews the king. The old king dies and a new ruling principle arises. It's a great, great adventure. It's just full of good things, just like Canaan was. All the way along the line, in images, metaphors, similes, allegories, picture stories of all kinds. And so I had a great dream when I headed out west and was in Santa Fe. I had a dream that we were in the upper room of our old homestead in Erie, Pennsylvania. And my two sons and their wives were there, and Trudy and myself. And we were standing in the upper room, and we were lifting our glasses and the toast, our wine glasses and the toast, to God. And we were singing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory 
to the newborn king. That means, my dear friends, that in my life the king has been renewed, hallelujah, and has given me a new lease on life and great new power in my ministry and in my message. I'm glad to walk with God like that. You'll go through the fires. Why do we go through the fires? Jesus said, I've come to kindle a fire on earth, and even now it's already kindled. Did you ever notice the other side of the great effusion of Pentecost? I'll send my spirit upon you. Listen, John the Baptist preaching. I baptize you in water, but he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost. You say, praise God, I was baptized in the Spirit. Amen. And if you haven't been baptized in the Spirit, I hope you will be as a Christian. And very soon and experience God's special touch. But listen, the rest of John's message was this. He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. And that's right. And he takes us through fire like he did Peter and James and John and the disciples. And he lets us flop and fail. Why does he do that? So that he takes out of our life everything that's not really us. Hallelujah. And what remains is really us. And it gives the king room to grow up and to become what God intended you and me to be in him. And that's our hope in Jesus Christ. And so tonight in God's sight, he sees you signed, sealed, and delivered. He sees you perfect and complete, without spot and blameless. Jesus doesn't teach a Sunday school class on morality, how to be good and how to be nice. You know why? Because you aren't good and you aren't nice. That's right, and you never will be. Can you accept that tonight? I'm not good and I'm not nice. You're not. Don't feel sorry for me. You're cut right out of the same cloth. We're all in this thing together. But you know what I am tonight? I'm royalty. I have the blood of God in my veins. I'm a son of God. And I confess to you tonight, I am a God. You say, boy, that's really brash. No, it isn't. That's scriptural. Jesus said to his contemporaries 2,000 years ago who wanted to kill him, the scriptures say, you are gods. John chapter 10. And I'm here tonight to tell you that you are gods. And your stewardship is to find the king in the Bethlehem of your heart and give him, as you listen to the Holy Spirit, he'll steer you like he steered Joseph into the environments that you need. He'll bring the people that you need to you. He'll bring you to the people that need you. He'll bring you the books that you need. He'll bring you the circumstances that you need. He'll even overrule your mistakes and build them into a fabric of success. All of your heart is set on him and you want nothing but God. 